now. And so I think, and and other, other groups like like the Muslim Brotherhood, which played a, a big role in the in the upheaval in January and February. I, my understanding is they're also opposed to strikes right now as well, and they're telling the workers to go back to work and to not fight. And so I, I think that um, this is the other thing that's happening is that is that once the initial goal is is achieved, then everybody else comes forward with their with their goals. And since so many of the demands. I mean, in many ways, Egypt kind of started this this global phenomenon that we're that we're a part of here, which is, you know, mostly young people fighting for around you know economic demands, but de but the economic demands that are, that are linked into the need for a real democracy in the society as well. Um, but in Egypt, I think that they're they're coming up against a point where it's like, okay, the first goal was accomplished, but the remainder just aren't, and now there's these serious fissures, and now the people who have taken over the revolution want to stop it in its tracks right now and make sure it doesn't go any farther. But how do we how do we accomplish the things that we need in order to stay alive, in order to have a, a decent life? Um, that, that's, that seems to be on the agenda now. And, and, all the, and now you can see where everybody stands in relation to the new set of demands that are being put out there. Just uh, going off on this, I don't think of uh, like US aid cut off by itself is going to create uh, conditions for uh, more like the military turning uh, towards the people because uh, as Abe mentioned military personnel have a lot of private investment in Egyptian economy itself not only outside so basically what would happen is like it would create a friction within the military but that could uh, I mean that could translate in a, in, in a way that such as Burma or even if it's in a softer version Iran but at the same time uh, Afghan al muslimi was one of the, uh, the the group you mentioned that the, the Muslim Brotherhood that uh, told people to go back and don't go on strike is the first group that basically struck a deal with military and that's how the military pa the, the, the council passed the constitution they had two weeks to draw up this uh, constitution nine uh, Nine, uh, pan nine member panel of judges to uh, draw up this constitution. They put it up for vote, yes or no, and ev a lot of people were saying no, but at the same time, uh, the time considering uh, the two weeks to write a constitution and the propaganda that went with it, it uh, made it pass. And basically right now what's happening is like uh, these uh, non-class-based analysis of the, the situation over there, is uh, basically trying to entrench their own interests that was denied before under Mubarak. And I, I totally, like, I see Mubarak's removal as an opening, but at the same time, this guy, Tantawi, he's a person who personally administered torture, even though he was uh, a general. He enjoyed that. So, uh, like, for me, it's not a big room, like, it's not a revolutionary move or revolutionary event that Mubarak is not there and this guy is in doing his thing. So I think I would say the revolution is still going on. I think I absolutely agree. There's no doubt in my mind that we haven't succeeded in our revolution. I think everybody recognizes that in Egypt. Some will admit it, some of them will just kind of, you know, play the denial game. Um, but uh, I think. We're probably halfway there, not even halfway there yet. So. I um, I looked at the clock you know, just a little bit earlier, and I wanted to discuss a little bit um, some of the parallels between uh, what's going on with Occupy and over there. Um, going back to the 25th, uh, or even a, a year prior to that, there was um, there was a, a conference with uh, Gemal uh, Mubarak, which is the son of Mubarak, and one of the interviewer uh, came up and, uh, excuse me, not interviewer, one of the uh, reporters asked the son of Mubarak, what do you think about the April 6th movement, which is an activist uh, movement, and the Facebook kids is what they call them. And uh, it's kind of funny because it's actually exactly what we're doing right now. And Gamal, who is supposed to basically take the leadership position before the revolution started, just burst out laughing. I mean, he was like, ha ha! <laughs> and, um, and they played that video for him so many times after he got his ass <laughs> It was awesome. But, um, you know, the thing though is that Facebook and uh, Twitter and all these tools have been used 
incredibly well in Egypt. Uh, literally on the 25th, I could go on Facebook or Twitter and see where people were moving from one street to another and people saying, we're getting blocked here, help us. Oh, it's like another group saying, we got 500 people, we're, we're coming to help you. And they were trying to figure out where to go. They didn't have the Tahrir Square figured out yet. Tahrir Square came out of necessity and it had only a couple of entrances that they could defend against. So it's kind of, it's almost like here. I mean, we we didn't know, I, I don't know, I guess, who the original organizers were, but, you know, if we pick this location as a strategic location or if we just kind of ended up here, does anybody want to comment? Actually, it, uh, Dave knows more about it yeah, than I do. Every, so. every meeting since the 26th, since the 1st, kind of in the beginning, about the third night or so was when we pretty much consented to come here. We, we started a process the second or third night roughly and had had the logistics committee members go out, this is before we had all the subcommittees, and we went out to various locations, about five or six um, locations here in San Diego. And, and kind of an overriding concern probably, we had probably 10 or 12 different factors to evaluate each one of them. But very important factors identified and consensus by everybody was proximity to restrooms and um, a symbolic locale. And so really, 24-hour restrooms, we kind of ended up with either down in the gas lamp by 5th, which left us with Children's Park or, or maybe the Embarcadero Park if the park police wouldn't hassle us, I mean the port police wouldn't hassle us, or the convention center, or um, here. And so, uh, we obviously looked at other locations, we looked at the county administration building, and, I, and the reason I mentioned Balboa Park, and uh, am I missing any of them here? The Midway. The Midway. Yeah, the USS Midway is Tuna Park. Um, we kind of kept those in the mind for fallback, and we actually did use those when they kind of, when the big, for the first big police raid was going to go on, and so people split, and um, whether we, whether we, empowered ourselves by by morphing and by becoming asymmetric, who knows? We ended up definitely kind of dividing ourselves for a while and it took us another week or so to get back on our footing and we reestablished Children's Park and here. Um, Children's Park, uh, again, close proximity to restrooms and here the, the center of power. So um, there's still ongoing discussions of whether to move to perhaps a city college or maybe a park or or maybe they continuously do. But for now, everybody has the consents when it has been discussed in the logistics committee, and I don't think it's ever come to the GA, has it? No, never has never come to the GA since about the fourth or fifth night. That's kind of the history for anybody interested. One of the things uh, in, during the Egyptian Revolution is that the exact, the exact same thing happened to us. The police cracked down quite hard on the first day. Um, and that's when all the YouTube videos start flowing and people get outraged and they start pouring out in the streets. Uh, just like us again, you know, after every police raid we have people come. But um, one thing that was really special about Egypt was that on Friday, there's a Friday prayer that's just like Sunday here for Christians. And after basically 1 p.m., everybody's pouring out of the mosques. And that was kind of an agreed like whatever happened, if they cut our internet, if they shut down our phones, if they turn the TVs off, we're all going to leave the mosque and head to the largest square or street. So in Alexandria, it was the Corniche Street, which is a huge uh, street that's based on the Mediterranean. In Cairo, it's here square. Suez has its own um, area, meeting area. Um, but the thing is that they had already hit critical mass in Egypt. I think one thing that happened here is that we had a good group at the beginning, but I don't think we, we hit critical mass yet, so now we're down to you know, a couple of dozen people, and every time we rally, we can't seem to recapture you know, our career square, so um, it's definitely something that's kind of frustrating me, and I don't know, you know how we can overcome that. Well, I don't think the object is to hold a square. We have many supporters online that some have never come down. And I think that it's more a question of winning hearts and minds. And I believe that 
Egypt cannot succeed unless we succeed. Because we're the belly of the beast. It's our government that is funding the army there. And unless we can change our system, no matter how many people they have in Egypt, the United States will send them more tanks, more planes, more bombs. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, you're dealing with the world's great superpower. And we have to change the system so that we become a world citizen instead of a world cop. Um, I, I just wanted to say, while I agree with an, uh, a few of the things, like America will continue to send any uh, regime it, it trusts as many tanks as possible. Egypt is the second largest receiver of U.S. Uh, military aid, next to Israel. Um, I completely and utterly disagree with your statement that Egypt cannot win without the U.S. I think that's an incredibly American-centric point of view, a very white point of view, and I think that, like, to, to re-entrench that ideology that says, like, no one else can do anything unless America does it first is really fucked up. And uh, you probably shouldn't, uh, uh, in my opinion, um, ascribe to that ideology. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into that particular discussion, uh, but I, I did want to, listening to what you were saying, it, it occurred to me that there are three things that are similar between what happened in Egypt and what happens in Occupy, and one thing which I think is, is different and important. Um, and you pointed out that Egypt was not simply Tahrir Square, but it was going on in Suez, it was going on in Alexandria, it was going on um, throughout the country, and, and this is what's happening with Occupy as well. It's also the case that Tahrir Square was, was symbolic in the sense that it, as I understand it, is basically the center of, uh, of Cairo and, and near the, uh, the party offices and the government offices, as this is symbolic. But the occupations are not symbolic. The occupations are real. And I think it's really important that, that we maintain them, maybe not here, although I kind of like the idea of being here, especially on the weekends, but, but the fact that we maintain the occupation goes beyond just symbolism. One of the things I, I think is different that we have to take into account in our, what we hope to attain here is that uh, my sense is that um, the, the Tahrir Square was the, uh, the process of a long political development that's been going on in Egypt that, for example, involved significant strikes in the textiles industry in 2006 and, and, and other things, as, other, other basically working class actions and political actions as well. So there was this process which we can only see partially, at least I can, very partially from being here, that sort of culminated in Tahrir Square. In some ways, the occupation is different. There, there, is, there was this subterranean anger, I think, which is being expressed through Occupy. But I think that in the United States, we have much further to go. And so we have to have realistic expectations about what's possible for Occupy to do. And, and, so, and, and I think, in some ways, uh, what we've been doing is, is really important. Uh, that is, I've seen a real um, increase in the level of organizational maturity in the last three weeks that I think is, is a very healthy thing for Occupy uh, to do. And, and I know, and then, and I, I've seen people really grappling with the problem of how do we reach out because there are, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in this county who I know they support us. I mean, I've been getting free drinks, you know, as a, as a result of this. We have to figure out how we convert that. I don't think it's enough just to have passive support. We have to figure out how do we convert that into active support. 100%. Uh, in Egypt, um, one of the models that was kind of proposed about what's happening in the revolution, you have the activist in one circle, you have the corrupt system in this circle, and then you have this huge circle, which is, I mean, some people call them the, the couch people. I guess maybe we, <laughs> we have something similar to that here. Um, and whoever can get the sympathy of the large group basically wins the revolution, uh, if, if you wish to call it. So I, I, I actually agree with the sentiment that you know, the occupation is not necessarily one, a physical one, but maybe also the occupation uh, of the metaphor of you know, feeding the corrupts uh, into a pulp. Um, 
I am actually on, on the media committee. I'm trying to bridge the gap between the 14,000 people on Facebook using polls, which is something